Welcome Soundies to our Sound for Video session. Great to have you all here today. Today is the 19th of March 2023, the last day of winter for those in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm very excited about that. And it looks like we got a weather report from nearly everybody here. So <laughs> thanks for sharing everybody. Let's jump over to our agenda and we will um, talk through what we're going to cover today. I am running solo today, by the way. So, oh, this live stream is the best. We can clear that. Uh, <laughs> so in any case, um, that was just a test message actually that automatically comes up, which is a little funny that I forgot and left it there. Again, uh, operating solo, Danny has some other responsibilities at the moment. Let's run through our agenda for today. First up, uh, next week, as a uh, note, we will have Michael Pedersen, the, the historian from Shore, coming back to visit us. And this time he's going to tell us a little bit about the lost lab notebooks of Ben Bauer. Ben Bauer, if you remember from last time Michael Pedersen came on, uh, he talked to us about the history of the Shore SM7. And tied up in that, of course, is the, de the development of the Unidyne microphone capsule, which was invented uh, and designed by Ben Bauer. So he's going to talk a little bit more about Ben Bauer's lab notebooks, which will be very interesting, I think. Then, of course, for today, we're going to talk about Cedar SDNX noise suppression. Specifically, we're going to demo, demo how that works on a Sound Devices um, 888 recorder. Um, this also runs on the 833, the Scorpio, and it's also available as a plug-in. Um, so if you're doing post-processing and you want to be able to use it there, it's also available there. It's also available in dedicated hardware boxes. But before we jump into all that, let me just show you, instead of telling you about it, <laughs> um, let me give you a little context for this. These are not inexpensive. The, anything from Cedar is not inexpensive. And let me just show you um, their website here. So Cedar Audio makes a de They've been in the business of making denoising hardware for a long, long time. So here, for example, is the Cedar DNS2. It's a piece of hardware. Um, production sound mixers in various cases have used it in their sound bags or on their sound carts to do noise reduction. It's also used often in live sound reproduction. And there's, I mean, it, it's it's probably, it's pretty much state of the art as far as live real-time noise suppression is concerned um, with dialogue. You can go to their website and there's a whole history on the, the background of DNS2. Um, again, it can be used in, as plugins in and also on dedicated hardware. It's not, it's not inexpensive. So for example, the Cedar Audio DNS2, which is a two-channel dialogue noise suppressor that runs almost $4,000 US. Um, the four-channel version, 6,000. I believe there's an eight-channel version uh, rack mount for almost $8,500. And then of course there's the plugins, um, VST, uh, VST3, AAX, I believe there's an AU version as well, over $2,000. So these are not inexpensive and <laughs> they had better be pretty good if they're that pricey, right? So this is what is available for the Sound Devices 8 series recorders. And let me just show you here today. In fact, what you're hearing is my microphone is coming in through input number one, and we actually should take a step back. Let me just show you here. I am using today a Jay-Z Audio V11. It's a vintage styled large diaphragm condenser microphone. That's what you're hearing right now. That's coming over into the 888, into channel number one here. And that's what you're seeing represented here. I'm feeding left the left stereo mix out into the Canon C200, which is the camera we're using, and then that feeds into the ATEM Mini. And today, incidentally, the ATEM Mini, we're feeding the output of that into an Epiphan Pearl Nano encoder, and that's sending it over to YouTube. So that's what we're experiencing here today. All right, um, so with that, if you, if I'm gonna go back over to the Mac, so we've we've got a little bit more context context now for the plugin for the eight series recorders, and it, you know again this is going to be the Scorpio 888 or 833. The pricing is eighteen hundred dollars for two channels, twenty four hundred dollars for four channels, or thirty six hundred dollars for eight channels. So it is 
uh, less expensive than the hardware if you already have an 8 series recorder from sound devices. The nice thing about that as well is that you can put it um, you don't have to put an additional piece of hardware in your bag or on your cart. It just sits, it, it runs on the, the mixer itself, which is really nice. So that's, uh, that's the context here. So again, not trying to demonstrate this and say, hey, you should go out and buy this. <laughs> I realize this is a pretty um, specialized tool for people that are working professionally and using recorder mixers like this. So there's also another question that came in. Leo asked this um, earlier is, what's the difference between Noise Assist, another noise plugin? In fact, if I come back over here to the Mac, we'll cut back over here. And if I go back, there's also this Noise Assist. And we actually did a video on that some time ago. Um, it's, it's available both for the 8 Series and, in fact, for the Mix Pre Series. For the 8 Series, if you buy two instances, that's six hundred dollars. Uh, instances refers to how many channels or buses you can apply it to, so it depends on how many channels you need to. If you if you just need to apply it to the stereo mix, for example, you can do that with the two instance version. Um, and then if you need more isolated channels, you can do that. And one clever thing you can do in that case is that if you are needing, for example, to you want to apply different amounts of noise suppression to each. To, to if you have one channel and you want to apply different amounts of noise suppression to it, you can actually implement it on multiple channels and apply different amounts of cedar or or noise assist um, denoising. So, in any case, that's how it works. Um, so, what we have today is I have a you can see it just over my shoulder here. Right here is a filter has a big fan in it and we can turn that on and make some noise. So let me go do that first. Now to make the most of today's session, and I just had a squeaky chair and I turn this on. Sorry for the camera wiggle there. You should be able to hear that in the background now. Let's see if I can hear it. Definitely. Um, give me a thumbs up in the chat if you're able to hear that as well. And let's see what we get here. Just confirming here that everything is going okay as far as the stream is concerned. Hopefully we're doing all right. Okay. We do have one question here from Christopher, and I will come back to this. I don't know the answer to this right now, but I use Cedar DNS 8D daily, so that's the rack mount version, I assume. Curious about SDNX is what it's called. Is the same algorithm with just the attenuation setting and bias fixed at zero, or if the algorithm is different from the hardware devices? I don't know the answer to that, to be honest, Christopher, and they're not particularly forthcoming with that information. Um, so I don't know. There is one setting, and that one setting is the... Um, is how much attenuation you want to do in terms of dB. So let's take a look into that right now. Let's go ahead and, ju and jump in. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to the camera here. There we are. Okay, so if I come into the menu here and come on down to noise suppression, whoops, go back, there we go. I can go ahead and turn that on. Now, I only have, I, I'm using the trial version here. I do not have the um, I have not paid for it. I don't, I don't need it <laughs> normally, but if I did, I wanted to test it out and they do have a trial, essentially a trial version here. So we can enable that and you're going to hear a beep every 10 seconds. So I apologize in advance, but that's how it works. Um, if somebody wants to send over $1,800, I'll be happy to buy it, <laughs> but, uh, you will hear a beep every 10 seconds warning in advance. Okay. It's now enabled. Let's go into the channel that we're working with. And what I can do is come right here. There's that beep. So we can apply some noise reduction. Here we go. Here is 10 dB, 10 dB of noise reduction using SDNX. Let me go ahead and turn that back off. As a comparison, there's zero. Yep, 
there's 10 dB, and there's 20 dB. 20 dB is going to be a little trickier. May get your voice a little bit more. Go back to 10. There's 10 dB of noise suppression. Okay, so let's let's go back and switch over to noise assist. Okay, now we're on noise assist and we have that set to also 10 dB. Sounds a little underwatery. I'm going to back that off some. Okay, there's 6 dB of noise suppression on noise assist. I, the initial impression I get is that noise assist is a little bit more aggressive, but also doesn't sound quite as natural. I'm going to gain down just a touch. And oh, one other, one other thing you can see here, the little circle that you see bouncing around right here, that's the noise suppression. So as I stop talking, it's going to do a little bit more. And then as I start talking, it backs off a little bit. So we were kind of up against our limiters a little bit more often than I would like there. Okay, so again, this is the noise assist. Let's go back over to Cedar SDNX and we're gonna do going to do that by going into the menu. Okay. Here again is Cedar SDNX. To me, I don't know what you're hearing on your side, but my impression is that Cedar sounds more transparent. It doesn't sound as processed. Um, it doesn't quite, it's not quite as aggressive unless you go to the more aggressive settings, but it, it tends to favor retaining the dialogue over eliminating all the noise, but it also does a very nice job of eliminating the noise. And I notice that when you go heavy on the noise assist, it gets pretty artifacty pretty quickly. So here we are heavy on the Cedar SDNX. And to me, that, that maintains the transparency transparency a little bit better and drop that back down here we are at 10 db of attenuation here's 0 db of attenuation here we are about 7 db of attenuation so that hopefully gives you a little bit of a sense um, in terms of how that overall sounds so with that, let me go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and leave that on, I guess. And let's go back over to our main camera and take a look at the chat here. Again, operating solo here. Um, Leo says that the DNX is crispier. I would say, yeah, I think it's more transparent. Um, it doesn't cut off as much of the, the overall dialogue. Christopher says on the DNS 8D, it's... Um, Minus 20 is very usable without much in the way of audible artifacts and damage to the quality of the voice, but the bias knob really helps tune that. Okay, so that's on the hardware that you're talking about. Even here, I felt like minus 20 was probably more than we needed, honestly, but um, sounded fairly transparent. And we didn't have, there's just, again, the, the one setting, how much attenuation you do. Um, here it says, Curtis, <laughs> it sounds like someone stole your catalytic converter. Um, I don't know if that's if you're referring to yeah anyway <laughs> you said SDNX can be used in live sound do you know where and why would it be used I've never used anything like that in a live PA I think if you're operating in a noisy environment that would be the case where you're going to do it so if you're doing on this is going to be more probably for news gathering than installed sound I would guess audio just to kind of clarify that um, yeah, more more of those types of situations where you know, or maybe maybe on the show floor of a convention, something like that, where you you know there's going to be ambient noise, and you're looking for um, a way to denoise that in real time, doing some sort of live live reporting. All right, 
Let's see here. Kevin says, no comparison, tons of artifacts in the noise assist, even at minus 10 dB. Cedar sounded really usable right up to about minus 20 dB. Minus 18 could definitely be used. That's closer to my um, understanding as well. I, I would say that noise assist is not useless. I think from my point of view, noise assist, you generally are gonna use more conservative settings. You'll still reduce a lot of noise. At, at minus four dB, I felt like it was re getting rid of more than SDNX was, but um, but if you push it harder than that, that's when you start to get the really the artifacts. So is SDNX just a smart gate per se? I don't think it's just a gate. I think it, it has some gating element to it. I don't know, I don't know what the magic is behind Cedar's technology and algorithm. I will say that there are other noise reduction processors, usually for post-processing. For example, in Isotope RX, the denoising plugins, the way they work is that they use gate at they use something like 256 gates at different frequencies, one, you know, one at each frequency range, and they independently gate for each other. So they're using some sort of detection algorithm to, to, to define what is voice and what is not, and then they're applying the gate when it's not no, when it's not voice. I don't know what that detection algorithm does, but that's that's how Isotope does it for voice denoise at least. Um, but there may be some element of that here. I, they're not necessarily sharing. <laughs> they're trying. Um, yeah, that's that's what they're doing there. Is your automix changing anything? No, automix is actually off right now, Leo. So that is not doing anything right now. All right, uh, Christopher says the DNS 8D, again, the hardware also appears to do some frequency synthesis. I did a review of the Solomon Phone Freak Lo-Fi mic, which has nothing above 4K, but run through DNS 8D has energy up to 10 kilohertz. Interesting. Yes. Um, I'm gonna, yes, Matt, something is beeping. That is the, the trial mode. Let me go ahead and switch that into, um, I'm gonna turn that off right now. Let's back over to the camera here. And I'm going to switch back over to, whoops, go here. Okay, we're now back on noise assist. And we'll go to minus four dB. Sorry for the beeping there. That is the trial mode. <laughs> Again, didn't have $1,800 to, to buy that. All right. Christopher notes, one of the sponsored artists for Cedar is WWF, where they do live in stadiums with poor acoustics and lots of crowd noise and need clean audio from the the actor, or I would assume the announcer. Um, okay, yeah, that would make sense there. Uh, Cedar is not just a smart gate for my testing, very protective of their secret sauce, of course. All right. Ah, Shoji said it, you're... This is, this is actually noise assist, not SDNX at this point. I know there's some latency between the comments, but just to be clear, right now you're listening to noise, um, noise assist and not SDNX. And Shoji said he heard some pumping. Pumping, what that means in practical terms is sort of you could hear the, the gate reducing the noise and then not reducing it as much and then reducing it more and then not as much so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, latency in this implementation of um, Cedar SDNX is evidently very low. Let's go back to the Mac and see. I don't remember what it said. Um, I just realized it's pretty hard to run a live stream like this alone. <laughs> Here we go. We'll cut back over. Um, all right. Let's see here. Is there any mention of latency here? One millisecond of latency. So that's going to, that's going to be pretty good. You're not going to, 
run into major issues there with that amount of latency. And I think of the same is, is true of Noise Assist. Again, different algorithm that was developed by sound devices as opposed to Cedar Audio. Um, and again, what you're hearing right now is the Noise Assist plugin. Um, Shoji says, hear the fan noise pumping when you were last using SDNX. Let's go back and listen to that again. So I'm gonna cut back over to the camera. There we go. And right now we're at minus four dB. Let's come on over into here. We will change. Again, you're gonna hear some beeping. Again, that's every 10 seconds there's a beep to indicate that we are in trial mode for Cedar DNX, SDNX, I should say. Okay, so now we are doing minus four dB of suppression on Cedar SDNX, and that's what you're hearing right now. Just gonna be quiet here for a moment to see what happens to the fan noise. And maybe go to a more extreme setting. There's minus 10. Okay. What happens when there are discontinuous noises? Footsteps, claps, bumps, other noises. Here's a snap back behind my back. I'm gonna keep talking and then snapping behind my back. I think you're still, I'm still here. I think I'm hearing that. Curious if you all are hearing that. Uh, claps behind my back, and then some footsteps. While I'm talking here, I can go ahead and do some steps as well. I think it's gonna be most effective for fairly continuous noises, like fans, like uh, maybe the low rumble of a crowd or a show floor, that type of thing. So there's an example there. Again, we're at minus 10 right now. We can go back off a little bit to minus four. Okay. Yeah, we're hearing all of that. So it's a, I think it's important to understand the limitations of things like this. These are not, uh, let me turn that off. <laughs> That's a little bit annoying for y'all, I'm sure. So we will go ahead and disable that. Okay, and here we are back with no noise re reduction at all. Okay, um, let me go ahead and turn the fan off. Okay, and just check our levels here. We're not running Okay, there we go. I think that's about where we wanna be. Okay. All right, so there is Cedar SDNX on the Sound Devices 888. Um, I think it is important to understand the limitations of these kinds of things that are super useful. Um, if you've got air conditioning noise, if you've got fan noise, if you've got maybe a generator running in the background, um, it tends to do best at steady Noises, by that I mean a noise that continues to operate at the same frequency over a pretty extended period of time as opposed to transient noises or discontinuous noises, claps, footsteps, um, other things like that. So uh, individual claps, I should say. If you've got a whole crowd cla clapping, I don't know what it would do. We'd have, to <laughs> we'd have to go to a stadium and see how that all pans out. But overall, that's um, SDNX. Let's see if we've got any questions. Uh, my chair creaks are coming through. There's the creaky chair. We are working on the creaky chair situation. I actually use, this is a drum throne I'm using today for my drum kit. Um, it's a little less squeaky than my other chair, which has just taken to squeaking like crazy lately. Don't know why. All right. Um, 
uh, what would the sound pressure levels be in pit row? I don't know when we're talking about uh, professional racing, it sounds like. And Christopher says, yeah, it won't take out those types of discrete noises. It's aimed at broadband uh, continuous noise. Agreed. Okay, cool. Well, that was fun to play with. I'm glad I, glad I finally pulled that out and checked it out. So overall, my assessment is that Cedar DN SDNX sounds more transparent. Um, I think somebody described it as crispier. That was uh, Kevin. I, was that Kevin that said that? Um, but yeah, I would agree that it definitely is more transparent. Um, it, it, it seemed to impose fewer artifacts uh, as well than noise assist. Although I think noise assist again could be still a useful tool. These are all tools. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, for me, the most likely situation here would be like a, a, um, a panel discussion, multiple people, each with their own mic. Um, I would probably use auto mix first. And then if there was some air conditioning noise or something like that, I might apply a little bit of either noise assist or SDNX on the at least on one channel of the mix, depending on what we were doing. If it was, if it's mostly being recorded for post production, then um, yeah, I would just apply that to the mix. If it was, you know, and you can actually apply it to a bus as well. So on the eight series, you have individual isolated channels. You have a, stere a stereo mix, left right mix, and then you also have, I believe, eight buses. So you can do, you can apply the instances to any of those up to however many you have licenses for. So that's that's the idea there. And um, I think it, again, useful tool, but this is something I wanna, I was musing on this morning. Danny and I were actually talking about this. Um, these are useful tools. They're not for everybody. You don't need them all the time. You don't need them if you're making YouTube videos, probably. Obviously at this price point, people that are making YouTube videos non-professionally, you know, for fun or maybe for your own individual channel with a lower budget. Not the tool for that. Um, but if you are doing uh, any sort of professional sound, that is you're getting paid to produce the sound for a show of some sort, that's where these types of things start to make sense. And again, I'm not here to convince you to go out, run out and buy all of this stuff. I'm here to just demonstrate so that someday if you are in a situation where you're going to be working on some sort of production like that, you're aware of the tools that are out there and you're aware of their limitations and what they're good at. So that's the main idea of demonstrating things like this. All right. Um, the other thing I was thinking about in, in, in the con in a kind of a similar vein was 32 bit float audio recording, which again, I, most of the manufacturers have taken to using that name for describing what I would prefer to call wide dynamic range audio recording. Um, 32-bit float is just the name of the container that they're storing the audio information in, but I don't think that captures it because that's just a storage format, basically, a, like a, a standard for a way to encode that type of information, wide dynamic range audio. But if your signal chain earlier than that, your microphone and your analog to digital converters are not capable of capturing that, you know, a really wide dynamic range, then 32-bit float is on its own not not super useful, but not super useful just for capture, I should say. For processing, that's a different story. Um, it's always nice to have 32-bit float for processing because when you do make some processing changes, you can always dial them back without losing information. Um, however, my, my whole point on 32-bit float was I see 32-bit float as a tool as well, but it's depending on what you're doing, it's a, it's a dispensable tool. <laughs> Audio engineers have been recording digital audio for years and years and years without 32-bit float, wide dynamic range capability, and doing just fine. Um, so there are situations where I think it's helpful as well, though. Um, again, if you're a solo operator, I would still very much encourage people to learn how to set gain um, because you're just pushing the problem to post. And what I have found is that on some of the implementations, some more than others, um, that when you record and you exceed zero dB in a 32-bit float recording, the converters don't, I don't know, something doesn't sound the same. Something doesn't sound as nice, as clean. It starts to take on some distortion or something. So I see 32-bit float recording for 
mostly spoken word types of situations as a safety net, but not as something to just turn it on and forget it. Um, I think you should still set the, you know, depending on how it's implemented, you should still set the levels to reasonable levels. Um, so those are some thoughts there. I don't, I'm not going to take the stance of you should never record in 32-bit float, but I'm also not going to take the stance of 32-bit float is a game changer and nobody should be recording anything without it. Um, it's just, it's a tool. If it's suiting your particular workflow, then use it and understand it, understand how it works, understand whether you're still getting the same results if you push it hard versus not pushing it as hard. Um, and then it, then it will serve you well as a tool. So, all right, let's go back to the chat here and see what we have going on here. All right. Yes, I agree, Shoji. They definitely sound different. So noise assist sounds, um, when you push it hard at least, it sounds a little bit more like there's a pillow on top of the person's mouth as they talk. SDNX definitely sounded more transparent. But again, if you, if you go lighter on the noise assist settings, I did find it still very useful. Could noise assist be better of the two at sudden noises? I didn't really find that to be the case. No, it didn't seem to do any better with those either. They both tended to do best with continuous noises. Um, okay. Okay, so Christopher made a clarification here. Cedar will tell you to reverse that. Specifically, when I was talking about uh, doing a panel discussion, I would I talked about using auto mixer. They they would actually apply the denoising first and then the auto mixer. So if that makes sense, I would definitely see that. So you're going to get a cleaner auto mix if you do the cedar first, the denoising first. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Um, Cedar, we use Cedar on NASCAR Fox coverage. I know we used it in the pit reporters, but I think we used some other places as well. Um, Shoji said, I think Noise Assist did a very good job at reducing the fan noise. I agree. I think it's, um, yeah, it's a tool again. It, and it's interesting too, the, the same could be, the same arguments could be made for, um, Mix Assist, which is one, which is the Sound Devices developed algorithm for auto mixing, as well as Dugan auto mixing, which both come on the 888 and or the 8 series. And I would say in those cases that it's a similar type thing, where I felt like Mix Assist was more aggressive and was able to, rem, you know, would attenuate the microphones that are not being spoken into currently a little bit more aggressively, so you got a cleaner mix. However, I did think that Dugan auto mixing sounded more transparent. It also did a nice job cleaning up noise, uh, you know, making a cleaner mix, but it was not as aggressive. So there was still some, uh, it, it erred on the side of remaining transparent and making the voices sound as great as they could be um, without maybe reducing quite as much noise was my overall impression there. So again, it really just depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, so each of them have their place. Okay, back to 32-bit float. Uh, Matt says they use several dozen track E's. These are the 32-bit pocket recorders on the Top Gun Maverick set recording 32-bit. I heard an interview uh, in an interview with the sound engineer. Yeah, for sure. It's a tool in those cases. When you're going to put a body pack recorder on somebody and you don't have the ability to monitor them, that's where 32-bit float is probably more useful. Yes, completely agree there. Um, Mark says, I'm curious how the Mix Pre Noise Assist works on, on the 888. I used Noise Assist quite a lot, but conservatively on my Mix Pre. Um, my understanding is that they're the same algorithm, so they should be very, very similar. I haven't done a head-to-head -to, -head to compare the two, but um, pretty, pretty much the same algorithm, so results should be pretty much the same. Uh, 
Uh, yes, Christopher, in clarifying the, the different types of auto mixes, Dugan versus Mix Assist, Dugan uses gain sharing. So in other words, what they're tr tr what it is the algorithm is achieving is that it's always, however many microphones you have open, it, they will always sum up to one. Um, so in other words, as, as most of the signal is coming through one, they will reduce the others and, and give more of the share overall to Dugan or to the, to the live mic, the one that's being spoken into, um, versus Mix Assist, which uses number of open mics algorithm, which essentially reduces the output by the number of open mics. You can actually see there's a, there, if you go to the Sound Devices webpage, there is actually a description of how Mix Assist works. In fact, let me see if I can find that here, and we can maybe even take a look at it. So we're going to go to sounddevices.com, switch over to the Mac here. There we go. And we're going to go ahead and do a search for Mix Assist. And I think... It was in this one. Let's take a look. I think in this one they had a description of how it works. Yes, about Mix Assist, page four. Okay, yes, it uses actually five principles. A noise adaptive threshold. So for each microphone, an ever-changing automatic threshold is continuously calculated. The per channel threshold has a slow attack and a very fast decay. When an incoming microphone signal is instantaneously above this threshold, it can be turned on. Steady state sounds, air conditioning, etc. will not turn on a microphone, only varying speech-like signals. So that's essentially kind of like a gate. Max bus is the envelope of all microphone signals is logically ORed together to get the instantaneous peak of the loudest microphone. Each microphone envelope is continuously compared to this max bus. If the envelope is greater and it meets the above NAT criteria, then it is gated on. If a talker speaks into two or more microphones, it will only gate on one of the microphones, eliminating any comb filtering. The last used microphone remains on, creating a seamless mix so that you don't get a complete dropout of sound, like, like room tone. Go ahead and take Christopher's note off the screen there. Um, you also get, when a microphone is turned off, it does not turn off, it does not turn all of the way off. Instead, it is attenuated by a certain amount, typically 15 dB. This results in a more transparent sound. So that's that's an example there where that differs from Dugan, which Dugan is going, again, it's going to be doing a, a calculation to make sure that all of them add up to a sum of one or 100% at any given time. And then you also have this number of open mic attenuators. So for each doubling of the number of open microphones, the gain is attenuated by 3 dB. This maintains the total gain throughout the system at zero dB. So the idea here is if you have multiple people talking at the same time, it's going to reduce them some as well. And this is, I think, the main operating principle of Dugan, if I understand correctly. So there's some nerding out on auto mix algorithms. <laughs> All right. Is there any chance sound devices will port Cedar over to the mix pre's? I doubt it, um, but I don't know. I don't have inside information, Kevin, on that, so I don't know for sure. Uh, yes, I am doing this solo today, Diesel. Uh, Danny had some other things she had to attend to. Yeah, and here's Christopher also notes that the Mix Pre probably doesn't have enough FPGA horsepower to run Cedar DNS? Don't know for sure, but that's a guess. Uh, Shoji asks, does noise assist add any delay? It does, and I believe it's also a very small amount, like one millisecond as well. Let's go take a look. Yes, just one millisecond per the Sound Devices website. So, pretty good. Definitely good there. Um... And then Kevin says, I was afraid of that. Guess I have to buy an 8 series sooner than I planned. <laughs> okay, good. All right, where are we at here? 1240, our time. 
If you have any other questions, let me know. Nobody submitted questions ahead of time. So we have some time for other things as well, if you wanted to cover other topics. Um, again, just to, to circle back for those that weren't here at the start of the stream, next week we'll have Michael Pedersen, the historian from Shure Microphones, coming on to join us again. And we will be talking this time about, or he will talking specifically about the lost lab notebooks of Ben Bauer. I, I Somebody found them. I think it might have been him, actually. Ben Bauer is the one who developed the original Unidyne microphone capsule and the Unidyne 2, I believe. I can't remember if he was involved in the Unidyne 3, um, but those dynamic microphone capsules were largely pioneered by Shure, and uh, Ben Bauer was the one behind most of them. There were some lab notebooks where he kept his own notes as he was as experimenting and developing the microphone capsules. Um, they were lost and then more recently have been found. And so there's going to be some interesting stuff there that we'll get a chance to talk about. Again, that's next Sunday at this same time on the live stream. All right. All right. Darren says, for our video conference voice live capture, we have had good results using Brushfy, Brushfy noise reducer to minimize HVAC server room fan noises. We have a few mics with Brushfy enabled in their firmware. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. It's an interesting name. Um, okay, so those mics have it actually built in to them, which is interesting. All right, Daniel James asks, why this particular microphone today? So this was a microphone that was sent to me by Jay-Z Microphones. They're a company based in Latvia. They're, they make uh, all of their microphones, I believe, are large diaphragm condenser microphones. They're primarily for music, but also, I think, could be very good for spoken word audio as well. Um, this one is the Vintage 11, and it has a, a voicing that is supposed to sound kind of vintage-y. If I get up really close on it, you get a lot of proximity effect. It does have a little bit of a, a bass boost to it, and fairly dark on the top end, or at least neutral on the top end, relative to a lot of other microphones. So we're getting ready, we're going to review it at some point, but I just thought I'd put it to use today as a start just arrived this week. So that's why we have that here. Um, and what happy coincidence, Sound Devices is doing a live demo on the 8 series right after this stream on their YouTube channel. So there you go. All right, can we talk about sound treatment on locations, specifically sound blankets, and how to find optimal placement on site? Example, using lav and boom for interviews, reverberant room. I could talk about my experience with that, Mark. So what I typically do is, I, I the ideal thing is to put the boom up on a stand if it's going to be a seated interview, so the microphone's not moving anyway. Um, get your headphones on, start putting blankets up, and see what sounds the best. So if you're not also the director and the gaffer, um, you may have to work with the, the camera department or the director or whomever. But in my case, I was doing all of it. So what I would do is I would bring the blankets in and use either the black or the white side, depending on whether I wanted to reflect any light or not reflect light, or actually negative fill light with the black side. Um, and I would get them in as, as close to I, as the edges of the frame as I could. That's typically going to do the most. I would put them on C-stands, um, cover as much of the area as I could and usually get them in as close to the edge of the frames as possible. I sometimes put them, if, there, if it's a space with a hard floor, I would put one on the floor behind the talent. And what that'll do is, is because the microphone is boomed and kind of aimed down at them like this, that would help eliminate some of the reflections off the floor into that boom microphone. So that's another technique that I've used. And then also you can put them up right by the camera. Like if, if, the, if, if my eyes are the camera lens, you can get them up like this as well to add additional treatment if you need to. But that's typically how I approach it, especially you're here talking about uh, interviews. Also, if you're in a really reverberant space, a lot of times the lavalier microphone is not going to pick up as much. You have the, the person's body is naturally going to block some of the sound from being picked up by the microphone from the back. So a lot of times that lav mic will do a little bit better than the boom mic in terms of the amount of reverberation it will pick up. It'll sound more like a lav mic, like it's attached to somebody's body, which is a downside in my opinion generally as well. But 
um, those are some of the things that I do to, to get those. Okay. Is anyone using round tripping from Premiere to Audition on Windows? It works on Mac, but I've heard it doesn't work well on Windows. Thoughts? I don't. Maybe, um, maybe others here do. I apologize. I don't have any anything to, <laughs> to add there. It should work on Windows, I would think. Um, that's kind of one of their Adobe's big selling points for Audition, frankly, is that it it can be you know the round trip process from Premiere should be pretty smooth. So. Matt says that this microphone, the Jay-Z V11, sounds good on my voice. Thanks for that. It's good to hear. Um, I'll help sponsor next week's two-hour broadcast special. <laughs> um, Shoji asks, good sounding mic. Are you doing any audio signal processing? Right now, we just have a limiter on. That is it. Nothing else. No EQ. Um, yeah, just a limiter, so we don't clip. That's it. And yes, solo operation. Okay, yeah, so that's that's how I was doing it too, Mark, um, as far as doing the sound blankets. So you get more freedom. You can move those blankets right in where you need to to get the sound how you need it to sound. So I'd put your headphones on and, and move them. I would generally, I found moving them in closer does a better job. So with the big sound blankets I have from... Um, these are from Vocal Booth to Go. They're pretty big. They're they're like eight feet, uh, I think, eight feet wide. Pretty long. Not sure. I've actually folded them in half, put them over the boom of a C stand, and then hoisted them up so that you know we would uh, we would catch as much as we could, cover as much space as we could. Oh, another thing too. If you're not showing the table, if someone is sitting at a table. Um, hard surface. If you can, I'd put a sound blanket on that table as well. That'll help with reflections quite a bit as well. Definitely worth considering here. Matt says, I carry lots of spare sound blankets. You can never have too many. I always wire a tracky with the Sankin Cost 11 Omni Lavalier and the 416 and the 50 Dual Boom. There you go. Lots of sound blankets. Oh, here's a good question from Teacher of Teachers. I often hear this problem in podcasts. The first word of each person speaking is missing. I'm sure this is because of inattention to auto mix. How can they avoid that effect? Actually, a lot of times that's a misconfigured noise gate or expander. Um, and I, yeah, I, that happens a lot on on, on um, podcasts. I think in most cases it's actually a gate, not so much an auto mix, or it's a badly configured auto mix, and I don't know which one it would be. Uh, because Noise Assist and Dugan don't have any setting. They're basically on or off, so there's no setting to make there. I would guess that more likely that is a, a badly configured noise gate, is my guess here. Mark says, I currently use three vocal booth to go 8x8 um, table. That's a good idea I've missed. Yeah, so the table can definitely make a difference too. Um, does anyone have recommendations on sound blanket brands or would a black and white moving blanket work? This is a question that comes up a lot. It, it depends on the moving blanket. You want something that's denser and usually cottons will, heavy cottons will generally attenuate more. Sound blankets will, will not generally manage a lot of really low frequency energy. They're just not dense enough and they're not thick enough to do that. Um, because low frequencies, you know, the waves are long, really long, meters long in case, in some cases for the lower frequencies. So um, sound, something that's dedicated as a sound blanket is usually much heavier. And so we generally do a better job, especially at mid, low frequencies. If you get a moving blanket, a lot of times moving blankets are made to be protective of furniture, but as light as possible. And so some of them generally will not manage uh, sound quite as well as a sound blanket will. So they, they can work, then they help, yes. Um, are they as effective as a sound blanket? Probably not, especially at the lower frequencies. So, it and again, it depends on the moving blanket, how heavy it is and the fibers that it uses. So those are some thoughts on that. Yeah, Christopher said also, think that's more likely a noise gate than an auto mixer. Okay, good, good. 
Mark says that I've been using 416. This thing can cost 11 on Sennheiser 500 series G4s. Very good. And here's a good question. If it, I, I have an idea, but I want to... Matt, you record with a Sankin Law of plus a 416 plus a 50. Why all three? It's a very good question. I have an idea. I'll come back to that in just a few minutes here. Um, vocal booth to go are excellent. I agree. That's the kind that I use. And um, the, I don't know where you're located in the world. I don't know if they ship internationally, but here in the United States, um, it's a good choice right there. Here's my guess. Um, Matt, we'll, we'll look forward to your answer. But my guess is that using all three microphones is that you get an option in post, which one you want to use. Um, some voices are going to sound better on others, and sometimes the positioning, a uh, lavalier is going to sound a little bit better or less roomy. We actually kind of heard some of that last week when we were talking about auto-align post. Um, I felt, always, always, almost always feel like this, the boom microphones sound more natural, but in, an, in a reverberant space, they'll generally pick up more reverb than a lavalier microphone will. So it's a trade-off, and you can potentially mix them if you choose to. That's an option. So... Yeah, so Matt says, uh, all three, I've been recording for five decades and I like options. So it's largely about options, having options, which one sounds best. Thanks for all the input. It's kind of painful seeing a moving blanket for half the price of a sound blanket, but the stated reason seems to be worth it. Yeah, I mean, there um, here in the United States, Harbor Freight, um, someone was telling me about Harbor Freight has some new sound blankets that are, or sorry, not sound blankets, moving blankets that are relatively heavy for moving blankets. Uh, I believe they're $15 each and they help. Um, I haven't used them, but they, they help. <laughs> if, you're, if you're dealing with some lower frequencies, that's where you're gonna wanna have the sound blankets. They're, they're gonna do a little bit better than a lighter weight moving blanket will. But yeah, they definitely make a difference there. Wow, doing a live stream solo is hard. <laughs> um, not nearly as smooth as it can be with, with uh, someone else helping like Danny. So let me know if you have any other questions out there. I have uh, coming up, I do have a microphone review. The Jay-Z V11 will be coming up here before too long. Um, what else do we have in the queue? I think that's the main thing right now today. We talked about so the lighting in the background here I don't know if you've noticed it very slightly shifts over time um, that is the Amaran pixel tube back there that's the four foot one that's hiding right behind these sound panels right here casting the light up on the door in that area there pretty good little lights if you need effects lights and they can do all sorts of fun stuff so that's pretty cool um, all right Sound blankets are the kind of thing that lasts forever, so cry once and all that. In other words, <laughs> it's worth the investment. I spent $350 and I got six big sound blankets and they have, I've had them for coming up on 10 years. They're doing just fine. Yeah, and that's, that's a pretty small price to pay. Most of us are, many of us are paying way more than that for a single microphone and frankly, a sound blanket is a tool you're probably going to use most of your career if you keep them dry and definitely worth it. I, I think my clients like to place me in the least desirable location. I've noticed that Bob Mike's uh, wins the echo war a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's part of the challenge. If you're doing corporate types of videos with interviews, a lot of times you're working in offices that were not designed for acoustics. Um, then that's pretty standard. That's the same thing I fought with all the time. If you can have, you know, if you're working with the same client and you and you have a couple of options, at least um, maybe that can help in some cases. And agreed with uh, Matt, a moving blanket is better than nothing. All right. Here's a good one for Matt. Um, good to have options, but which of the three options do you most often use? That's a, that's a good one. Uh, teacher, teachers, I once had to revisit a place to reshoot an interview because something happened with the lav. 
I have, I had I been running a boom also, I would not have had to do a reshoot. Never again. That's why we, yep, that's exactly why we do both. No Neve Shelford channel in the mix today. That's correct. No Neve Shelford channel in the mix today. No compression, just a limiter. That's all you're hearing today. So it's probably a little quieter today than typically. Um, <laughs> Darren asks if I have any picks for March Madness or anyone else out there has picks for March Madness. I, do, I have not followed it at all, Darren. I, I hope that you'll still respect me, um, but I have not followed. All I know is that uh, Danny's father taught at Purdue previously and then he taught he finished his career at University of Utah but taught at Purdue um, and that there was a massive upset for Purdue that's all I know so far all right Matt says MKH 50 is what I would pick most the love uh, will win with rush jobs yeah that makes sense that definitely makes sense to me too I actually, uh, you know, now that we have auto align post, I, I think I'm probably going to be experimenting more with mixing lobs and booms together, where it makes sense, depending on the situation. But that gives me another option there too, which I like quite a bit. If you get clean audio on both of those. Um, uh, Shoji says, thanks for the practical knowledge. And <laughs> Matt says, yes, five decades of things going wrong. It's true. The best engineers are the ones who have learned from their, their mistakes and learned from the issues that have come up. Um, and that that's really the hallmark here. Learn Learning from your mistakes and building in processes to prevent those mistakes from ever happening again. Or... or issues arising that you didn't anticipate and being ready to address those those issues is a, is a sign of a very experienced engineer. Um, since we are doing confessions, I forgot to hit record and had to bring the talent back for an entire interview. Yeah, not bad idea to have a checklist of some sort. Um, okay, and then here's a thought for you, Matt Ruff. Any thoughts of replacing the 50 with the 8050? I've actually, I have found that they sound remarkably similar. I feel like the 50s polar pattern is a little bit narrower, possibly just a tiny bit, but they sound very, very similar. So, um, what other projects do we have coming up? We've been on kind of a lighting kick lately. We're going to have probably one more lighting video, and then we're going to go back to sound uh, on the main channel. So next week there'll be, I think, it depends. It depends, but I like, I think I like this microphone. I'm curious, what does everybody else think? Is it, uh, yeah, no processing whatsoever. So, um, all right. I had a colleague here who once uh, lost his place hitting the record button on the camera and the interview did not exist except in audio. Ouch. Yeah, you should always check for the tally light to make sure that's on. Uh, what polar pattern with lobs do you prefer? I use Omni in live sound to avoid P-pops, but it picks up more of the room. I've actually found that cardioid lavaliers are kind of tricky. A lot of them don't sound that great, with the exception of one that I've tried, which was the Shure... Is it the Uniplex? It's, it's actually quite new. Um, but positioning them can be tricky. If you're using them for instruments, maybe that would be okay. But the Shure Uniplex is an interesting one because it's actually using a MEMS capsule, um, which is basically... a it's. It's actually what's in our laptops and our phones and stuff like that, but they do some processing and it actually sounded extraordinarily great for a MEMS microphone in particular, but it was also unidirectional. So that's the one that I probably, if I had to go with a cardioid, that's the one I would go with. But generally for, for spoken word, for film and video production, we're using Omnis as well. I'm, I'm all minor Omnis. 
Good question there. All right. Christopher says, a test for audio auto-align post, sync the raw ISO channel and an SDNX channel, which will be a few samples behind due to plug-in latency. Yeah, we could do, we definitely could do that. Uh, here, <laughs> 40 years of theater touring, work long enough and you'll make almost every mistake and hopefully make them not more than once, possibly twice at the most. Um, Daniel says, sounding good, nice mic. Mic is good, sounds excellent, sounding good this week. New mic controls sibilance well. In fact, that's um, one of the things that I talked about when they contacted me and they said, hey, we have all these beautiful mics. How, how would you like to review one? And um, we looked through, I looked through the catalog and I was like, well, and I listened to some samples online and I was like, I know we don't want, uh, they, they actually have a whole array and they actually, what's nice about them is that they actually lay them out on a, on an arrange, a range. So you understand how bright sounding they are. And this was the least bright sounding of them. So it handles the, the, um, the sibilance pretty well. Twinplex. No, I think it's actually Uniplex. Um, Uniplex is the one uh, if you're looking for a cardioid. It's a pretty good mic. I actually was going to review it, but I didn't have the Shure system to support it, and they weren't able to terminate it in Audio Limited for um, with the Audio Limited form termination. So I didn't end up end getting to do a review. At some point, I probably should buy a Shure wireless system just so I can test that stuff. Um, all right, so. Shoji says, the 50 is an industry standard, but the 8050 seems to be a newer design with a flatter response. Yes, it sounds remarkably similar. Um, the, the difference is very, very subtle. It's much smaller, so if you're going to be hand booming it, there's an advantage there <laughs> for sure. Although I think that the 50 does better at handling noise, at managing handling noise, than the 8050 does actually. It's my overall experience. All right. Uh, Shoji says, good, sounds good on your voice. Nice full sound, good intelligibility. Sound is good. Very good. All right, my friends, it's two minutes after the hour. Danny's not here to say, shut it down. <laughs> it's been great to have you all here today. I hope you all have a terrific week. Get out there and work on some of your sound projects. And uh, I'm queuing this all up here. We'll talk to you again really soon. Take care, everybody.